Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, the Southern Glazers Distinguished Leaders Fireside Chat. Uh, I'm John Quelch, uh, the Dean of the University of Miami Herbert Business School. And uh, I've always told you, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you only the best. And tonight we're bringing you better than the best, uh, Lee Cooperman. Uh, and to introduce Lee in a moment uh, will be uh, Vice Dean Henrik Kronquist, who is uh, the Bank of America Scholar and Professor of Finance uh, here at uh, uh, Miami Herbert Business School. Uh, Lee is uh, an iconic person in the, uh, the world of uh, hedge funds and the financial history of investment in the United States. Uh, we know how important Lee is because we looked at the list of people who have registered for this event, and we see on this list a, a marquee set of names from among our friends and alumni. So thank you very much for joining us this evening and uh, over to Henrik for the introduction. Thank you so much, uh, Dean. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Lee Cooperman tonight. So he's one of the most successful Wall Street investors that the world has ever known. And we will learn to know a little bit more tonight about his investment style and his thoughts about the market conditions right now. So he re received his uh, undergraduate degree from Hunter College and then his uh, MBA from Columbia Business School in New York. And his career has uh, two main chapters and of course many sub chapters. So the first uh, chapter was to spend uh, 25 years with Goldman Sachs and building up the Goldman Sachs Asset Management uh, Division. And before that, he uh, was uh, heading up uh, the um, investment research department within Goldman Sachs. And one of the impressive things was he was awarded nine consecutive years in a row, the number one portfolio strategist um, uh, award by Institutional Investor Magazine. And then the second chapter is that after Goldman Sachs, uh, Lee launched his own investment company, Omega Advisors. And at its height, when they had external money, it was more of a, of a $10 billion uh, operation. And then in 2018, uh, Omega Advisors was uh, converted into a family office. He's a CFA as well, which means a um, chartered financial analyst. And among the many positions that he has had, uh, he's, uh, he's the past uh, president of the New York Society of uh, Security Analysts. Uh, Lee has received uh, many different uh, awards, not only on Wall Street, but also for some of his uh, philanthropic uh, efforts. To give two examples, one from each domain, domain in uh, 2013, uh, Lee was uh, inducted into Alpha Magazine's Hedge Fund Hall of Fame, which is a great honor for any uh, investment professional. And in 2009, uh, he was uh, uh, the recipient of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Newark um, Award for Caring. So I think our current students here at Miami Herbert and our alumni, whether you're in the finance industry or not, you will learn a lot from the discussion that we will have tonight. Uh, and so we're going to structure this by first, we're going to have Mr. Cooperman uh, uh, displaying to us a couple of different uh, slides that he has uh, generously put together and then we will open up for Q&A and I have some questions and I look forward to receiving more questions in the chat as well. So Lee, uh, warm welcome to uh, Miami Herbert Business School and uh, let's get started here. Welcome. Well, thank you for your very gracious introduction. Uh, I'll say good afternoon to all the viewers and listeners. It's a pleasure to be with you. It would be a greater pleasure to be with you in reality rather than virtually, but that, that'll happen soon, one of these days. I found over the years that sessions like these are as valuable to the listeners as the quality of your questions. So I'm going to discuss a few things early on, uh, but make sure when we get to the Q&A, you don't hold back and you ask whatever interests you. And because if uh, you're interested, I'm interested. I thought I'd give you a little bit about my background my approach to business and life, uh, and some observations about hedge funds, and that my goal in some of these slides is to share with you some of the important things I've learned in my business lifetime, because that will be designed to help you. And I, you know, I've been doing this for over 50 years, and so I have a little bit of experience. 
Um, I say at the age of 78 and being an investor for over 50 years, I'm entitled to be a bit of a philosopher. <clears throat> so given my diverse background, what I mean by that is uh, Henrik, if I can call you Henrik, basically uh, indicated I spent 25 years of my career on the sell side with Goldman Sachs, and then I spent the last 27, 28 years at Omega on the buy side. So I can respond to your questions from many vantage points. Number one, I'm a poor kid at the South Bronx that became successful. So I can speak to the issues of being poor and being rich. That one I find very easy, rich is better. Uh, second, uh, as I said, I've been a sell side research analyst, uh, sell side portfolio strategist where I was number one for nine years with II Magazine. And then I've been the chief investment officer before I retired from Goldman Sachs of their asset management business, which I started in 1991, 1990 actually, and I think now it's a couple of trillion dollars. And then I became a hedge fund manager well before it became fashionable. Uh, I'm now retired, so uh, it is what it is. I also, during my career, I was chairman of the audit committee of a $100 billion corporation called Automatic Data Processing, one of the great corporations in America. So I understand the issues of corporate governance and Sarbanes-Oxley, and we can talk to that. I have a lot of philanthropic involvements, and I have a view towards philanthropy, and while that may seem very remote for most of the people on the call, um, you know, I'll share my view of philanthropy with you, but to be a philanthropist, you gotta first get money. So we're gonna try to help you make some money first. It was a great trip from my beginning in the South Bronx to where I sit here today. Uh, I should be an inspiration to all of you, uh, all of the youngsters on the call, you know, that with an average IQ, uh, a strong work ethic, and a heavy dose of good luck, you can go very far. You know, I'm the first generation of my family born in America. Uh, my family, my father came to America at the age of 12 as a plumber's apprentice, uh, never went to school, uh, and uh, basically, uh, I went to public school 75 in the South Bronx. Uh, I went to Morris High School in the South Bronx. I have an older brother I'm very close with who's seven years older than me, and he was classmates with Colin Powell at the same high school as I went to. Uh, unfortunately, just passed away. And then I went to public uh, college. I followed the advice of Harlan Screwley, who said, go west, young man. So I left the East Bronx, and I went to the West Bronx, where I went to Hunter College, which is now called Lehman College. Um, upon graduating from Hunter, uh, I worked for about 18 months in Rochester, New York for Xerox Corporation, and then I returned to New York to attend Columbia University Graduate School of Business, where I got an MBA. And that, frankly, uh, that advanced degree is what uh, changed the trajectory of my business life. That opened the door to Goldman Sachs, which I never, I don't, I'm not saying it's right, but it is what it is. Goldman probably never would have hired me out of Hunter College with a liberal arts degree. When I got the MBA, that made me more marketable. Uh, I had a different philosophy when I started my business. I, I looked to hire PhDs, but my definition of PhD was somebody who was poor, hungry, and driven. So that was my hiring criteria. You know, uh, I didn't look for, uh, you know, people with distinguished backgrounds necessarily. Uh, so I had a debt of gratitude to Columbia, which I've repaid. I've given about $40 million uh, to Columbia Business School, you know, over many, many years. And, uh, and the same to Hunter College, where I got my undergraduate Not only did I get my undergraduate degree at Hunter, but I got it for a, a princely sum of $24 a semester. And I met my wife for 56 years in my sophomore year, and we're still married. So, you know, I had a big grit of gratitude. So if we go to the slides, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, you know, impart to you slide number one is, uh, not to cover the next, this exhibit one, you know, um, I'm going to read it to you, although know, you can see it very clearly. Every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up and knows it must run faster than the fastest lion or it will be killed. Every morning, a lion wakes up and knows it must outrun the slowest gazelle or it will starve to death. It doesn't matter whether you're a lion or a gazelle. When the sun comes up, you better be running. Now, what's the relevancy for somebody like me and my business? Well, I didn't hire anybody without telling them the story about the lion and gazelle. And what's the relevancy to my business? Very simple. Roughly speaking, there are 10,000 mutual funds that would be happy to manage your money for 1% or less. And they're roundly speaking about 10,000 hedge funds that have the audacity or the language of my grandmother, the chutzpah, 
to uh, look for a fee of between 1% and 2% and 20% of the profits. So, if, uh, assuming your client is in a mullet, if somebody's willing to pay you such a large premium fee, they have the right to expect premium performance. So what that means is you're always in the balls of your feet. You, uh, if the equity market in the U.S. is uninteresting, you're supposed to figure out what makes the most sense. And basically, um, just bear with me. Uh, I'll get rid of this call. Um, you know, and uh, figure out what's going to work and uh, try to deliver superior performance. And so you're, you're never resting on your laurels. And I have found over the years, the harder I worked, the luckier I got. And I would say to the people that interview, I interviewed, hard work never killed anybody. Um, then I, exhibit two is a cornerstone of my philosophy and something you should remember. I don't think Andrew Carnegie was a sexist. Women were not part of the labor force back then, so I would like to modify his comment. He said, I wish to have as my epitaph, here lies a man or a woman who was wise enough to bring into his or her service men or women who knew more than he. And that's the secret to success. Don't be threatened by strong people. Always try to hire the very best to work with you and be benefited by their skill set. And uh, that, uh, to me, is a very important characteristic of business. Um, then we go to exhibit three. Um, is one of about integrity and uh, reputation. And I quote Reverend Billy Graham, when wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. But when character is lost, all is lost. So conduct his life as an open book. I tell that to my kids. I have th two boys, 55 and 52. I have three grandkids that age from 24 down to 13. And, and uh, 1900 and uh, I guess it was on my 65th birthday, whatever that was, that's about 13 years ago, this exhibit four, I took them to away for an all expense uh, uh, vacation on my 65th birthday. And all the expenses were paid for by me, if you can imagine. And I share with them some different comments that I have here. And the first one is most important. The first test of a gentleman is respect for those who can be of no possible value to him. And my advice to you is be nice to people not just people above you, but be nice to people below you. I have seen over the years that people that treat people in a position superior to theirs with great respect and uh, kindness, and they're not particularly kind and nice to people below them. And that's a huge mistake. And so just treat people of all skills, all likes, all positions equally. Also, I preach engagement. Aristotle said tolerance and apathy are the last virtues of a society. Don't go through life as a bump on a log. Stand for something. Hopefully you have good, virtue, good values, good virtues, and share those views with others. Also, I say, you know, I knew nothing about Wall Street when I went to Goldman Sachs. I was the son of a plumber. I had the experience 16 months trimester at Columbia, and I never thought about making money. And Henry Ford said, it, well, the best way to make money in a business is not to think too much about making it. Warren Buffett says, go to work for somebody with my and respect, tap dance to work, and the money will take care of itself. And uh, that leads me to my next view. Uh, success, the only way to be successful, go back to the prior slide, please, slide four. The only way to be successful is to do what you love and love what you do. You cannot possibly work the hours that I work if, unless you enjoy what you're doing. And so... Uh, very, very important. Don't go into a field for money. Go into a field because you have an aptitude for it and it's something you enjoy. Uh, for the 25 years that I was at Goldman and 26 or 7 years at Omega, I got up every day at 5:10 in the morning. I slept into New York from Short Hills, New Jersey, uh, on the train or drove in, and basically I, I, I enjoyed every minute of my uh, working career. Then I get into philanthropy, um, and that's the stage of life I'm at now. Just bear with me. I'm on a conference call. I can't talk now. Who is this? Okay. Um, and philanthropy, uh, and, you know, there's a lot of different quotes I use to make my points. I like to use the words of others that have more credibility than me. Albert Einstein said, only a life lived for others is a life worth living, you know. This is not normally associated with Pablo Picasso, but it fits me well. The meaning of life is to find your gift. I found my gift is uh, extracting profits from the market, and the purpose of life is to give it away. I'm at that stage of my life now. Now we go to Exhibit 5. 
I have a, um, a granddaughter who's very, very philanthropic, very, very liberal, more liberal than I am, but she's very, very smart. She graduated Stanford Phi Beta Kappa um, and works for the black housing movement in Washington, D.C., uh, doing her master's thesis on how the black community was disadvantaged by redlining because they were not able to get into home ownership. So my uh, granddaughter, I get a little choked up, so I have to avoid being emotional. If I'm not for myself, then who will be for me? If I'm not for others, then who am I? And if not now, when? And those are the words of the questions of Rabbi Hillel and my granddaughter Courtney. She gave the answers. I'm not going to read them out to you because I get sentimental. Uh, and then uh, the last quote is a quote that I've lived my life by. I read about it about 15 or 20 years ago. I tried to figure out who William Ward was. I went to Google him, but there were about 12 or 15 William Wards. So I couldn't figure out which one. But whoever uh, put together this paragraph, it was a philosophy that resonated with me. And that is, before you speak, listen, words hurt. Before you write, think, okay? Before you spend, earn. Before you invest, investigate. Before you criticize, wait. Before you pray, forgive. Before you quit, try. Before you retire, save. Before you die, give. I guess I must be at that stage now because I've been giving away a lot of money lately. Uh, and uh, I told my family that statistically that if you make it past 65 and cancer doesn't get you, on average, we'll make it to about 82. So I got uh, four or five years left, and uh, hopefully I can stretch that out. And I'm not in a rush. You know, I like to quote Warren Buffett. He says he'd like to know where he's going to die, so he'll know not to go there. So if I can figure out where I'm going to die, I'll know not to go there. Exhibit six is when I took my family. Uh, no, exhibit six is a different sequence. For those of you that are interested in career in Wall Street, I thought that we have a diverse audience. So, you know, uh, maybe we have some philanthropists, we have some would-be philanthropists, we have students. So I try to mix it up, the content. So if you're interested in going to work on Wall Street and going to work by somebody like myself, I put together uh, 14 characteristics of an outstanding analyst or portfolio manager. And so read through them, study them. And if this is not you, don't push yourself in a direction that you're not committed. You know, we'll get to this in the Q&A period, but you know, you got to have the intuition to move yourself in the right direction. So I won't read all these things, but it's, you know, computer knowledge is very critical, ability to write your story, your views out in a concise manner, you know, intensity to be the best and, you know, very strong work ethic, very important, but I won't read them all, you have them. If we go to exhibit seven, um, you know, the hedge fund industry was not always paved with a road to gold, with gold. This was from a, a, a story written in 1970 by one of the most distinguished writers at Fortune magazine, Carol Loomis, who's co-authored Warren Buffett's annual report for almost 50 years. And she wrote an article in 1970, January to be precise, that was entitled, Hard Times Come to Hedge Funds. And this exhibit was included Okay, and she showed how the hedge funds got decimated in the 68 to 70 bear market, with the exception of one guy, Michael Steinhardt, who was up a little bit because he was a very noted short seller. And I got to tell you, uh, she was only right cyclically, because at this time in uh, 1970, the hedge fund industry was maybe a billion dollars. Today it's three trillion dollars. So she was wrong in a long-term picture. She was very right in a short-term picture, she was jumping on a trend. And reality, basically, is there's always going to be a need for an intermediary. The question is whether you can provide performance to justify uh, getting the money from the client. And if you can deliver the performance, you'll do just fine. So I'm very positive in the hedge fund industry, uh, more so now than I was most of the last 10, 15 years. And I'll explain why when we get to the market outlook. If we exhibit eight, um, talk a little bit about the market. Um, I think I skipped an exhibit, um, uh, and it was a very important exhibit, um, and so I won't, I won't look for the exhibit, but I'll just tell you, what I told my family, I took them away for my 65th birthday, is the following, there's nothing more important than family. They root for you and care for you more than anyone else, so be, stay close to your family. I happen to think one of my great accomplishments is my kids and my grandkids still come home, you know, and I'm close to my children, 
and I think it's very important. Secondly, it's great to have friends, but to have friends, you have to be a good friend. Be trusting, friendly, and supportive of your friends. Extend yourself whenever you can. I have no tie to the University of Miami, but here I am spending an afternoon with you guys because I believe in uh, extending oneself and being helpful to people. And Ralph Waldo Emerson said it well. He said, the only way to have a friend is to be one. So be trusting and be uh, available to help people. Three, never do anything in life that if what you did appear in the front page of the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, you would be embarrassed. I had a, a stint with the SEC. I won the case. They did substantial damage to me. They're a rogue organization, in my opinion, but I won't dwell on that. And finally, uh, my last observation to my family, which I hope to empower them with my uh, legacy, is that um, you know, when you've achieved financial security, you share your success with others less fortunate than yourself. Because in a biblical sense, we are our brother's keeper. Um, and uh, I talked about my philosophy of philanthropy, so I won't go back to that. Um, and so now we can talk to about the, the market. And I, I tell you, I have a mixed view. I noticed in one of your upcoming distinguished speakers is Larry Summers. And I interviewed Larry about two weeks ago. I do a distinguished speaker series myself like this on behalf of the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. And every year I get two bright fellows in. And Larry's a liberal, you know, left with leaning economist, but made the observation that he never saw a more irresponsible package of fiscal monetary policies as we're seeing presently. And uh, I happen to concur with that view. And so, but, you know, I call myself a fully invested bear a fully invested bear. So let me explain what I mean by fully invested bear. Number one, bear markets don't materialize out of immaculate conception. Bear markets come about for some fundamental reasons. And uh, I'll review them with you. That's exhibit eight. Accelerating and problematic inflation. We have that now in my opinion, but the most important comment I'm gonna to make to you is inflation is a friend of common stocks because the inflation in a company's cost gets reflected in selling prices, which lifts the nominal level of revenues and earnings. Inflation becomes a problem for the market when the central bank is moving to curb inflation, because curbing inflation is tantamount to curbing growth. We have a central bank that doesn't seem to think this inflation is problematic. They think it's transitory. I think they have their heads in the wrong part of their anatomy. You know, 64% of a typical business cost is labor, and labor costs are not going to moderate. And uh, we have extraordinarily stimulative fiscal monetary policies. Um, I'll talk about them in a moment. The second reason you have a bear market is a hostile Fed. If anything, we have a very accommodative Fed, and I'll show you that in three slides in a moment. Investor exuberance. What we have here is a very bifurcated market. We have some parts of the market that are experiencing great exuberance. We have some part of the markets are not. And so I call it, uh, we have a bifurcated market. We have, some opt we have some signs of excessive optimism and a few signs of euphoria, but no broad-based uh, excessive uh, valuation. And then finally, you get a bear market, but you can't forecast because of some significant geopolitical event. Plain to worry about, whether it's Taiwan, China, Russia, Ukraine, etc. So I would say that I I'm fully invested because the conditions that cause a big decline are not present. If you look at Exhibit 9, um, you can see something that's very obvious. Every bear market has been preceded by a high and rising level of the real funds, Fed funds rate. That's the Fed funds rate adjusted for inflation. Every, the bear markets and recessions are the shaded areas. Notice that before every bear market, you had a, a high and rising Fed funds rate, 2% uh, up to 10%. We currently have a negative fund rate, funds rate of over two percentage points negative. You've never had a bear market in that kind of environment. And what the Fed is doing, in my opinion, is pushing everybody out on the risk curve. Okay? The uh, buyer, historically, of T-bills says, I cannot get by on zero. I'm going to take inflation and duration risk, and I'm going to buy T-bonds. The T-bond buyer says, 1.5% does nothing for me after taxes. I'm going to buy industrial bonds. The industrial bond buyer says, 3% doesn't work for me because that's hardly any return adjusted for inflation and taxes, I'm going to buy high yield. The high yield buyer says 6% isn't too attractive now in any historical context. I'm going to buy structured credit, which is CLOs, 
which are more opaque. And the CLO guy says, you know, the hot market is equities. So I'm going to take 25% of my fixed income fund and put it in equities. And the uh, uh, equity guy said, I'm putting 2% in Bitcoin. Not because he understands Bitcoin, only because it's working and it's going up. If you look at Exhibit 10, there's the real 10-year uh, rate, uh, real 10-year rate, Exhibit 10. Hello? Okay. Well, you see the same phenomena. You know, uh, bear markets are preceded by high and rising real 10-year yields. You know, the 10-year yield is 1.5%. The inflation rate is 6%. So the real yield is much worse than it is now. We're kind of smoothing it out. So uh, the main plus for the market is the very accommodative monetary policy. If you look at Exhibit 11, you can see uh, history. You know, in the last 50 odd years, the S&P multiples averaged uh, 14.9, core 15, when the rate inflation rate was six, one to three percent. The multiple averaged 16.7. We're currently a touch on the 21, but we look at the comment on the right. When the multiple average 15, the 10-year government was 6.2%, it's currently 1.6%, and the Fed funds rate average 5%, currently is near zero. So you could justify any level of valuation against today's interest rates. The question is whether today's interest rates are realistic. I don't think they are. Exhibit 12 tells you why nothing's overvalued. There were two periods of extreme valuation in the market that I lived through. One was a nifty 50 era of 1972, where the dominant investing institutions were JP Morgan and US Trust. And their philosophy was only the right stock at any price. They didn't care what they paid for what they bought as long as it was a world class premier growth company. So back in 1972, Avon was 65 times earnings, Dow Chemical 25, Eastman Kodak, which went bankrupt 48 times earnings, G26, IBM 37. Kmart went bankrupt 34 times earnings. Polaroid went bankrupt 90 times earnings. Revlon, near bankruptcy, 30 times earnings. Sears Roebuck, 30 times. Kmart, uh, and they went bankrupt. Kesgri, bankrupt 34 times earnings. Look at the right-hand column. The Taya government in 1972 was 6.5%, and the T-bill rate was 4.6%. Against today's interest rates, multiples are lower today than they were in 1972, and interest rates are a mere fraction where they were. Similar phenomena, Exhibit 13, I looked at the last bubble in technology in 2000. Walmart, 44 times earnings. Cisco, 380 times earnings. ExxonMobil, 23 times. Intel, 54 times. GE, 45 times. Okay, you get the picture. The 10-year government was 6% in, 19, seven, in, in 2000, and T-bills were also 6%. And so again, uh, we can't argue for excessive valuation but we can argue for is that the bond has no business, in my opinion, being at this level, and it's very complex, you know, very complex. I think it's the result of the Fed keeping short rates so low and very low global interest rates. Um, and I think the, uh, the bubble, are not stocks, the bubble are bonds. If we look at Exhibit 14, um, This kind of fits my thinking. I think fiscal and monetary policy have borrowed from the future. Let me give you two examples. If you put 100 economists in a room, and you're not going to get any much better than Larry Summers, and you're going to have him in December, I think. So ask him the question, Mr. Summers, Professor Summers, what do you think the trend growth rate is of the US economy? I think the response would be centered around 2% real. And you get there because the real growth is a function of productivity growth and labor force growth. Productivity growth is estimated to be about 1.5% per annum, and labor force growth about a half of 1%. So real growth about 2% per annum. This year, we're going to grow at probably three to four times trend, yet we have interest rates at near zero. That makes no sense to me. Secondly, we've already injected, prior to this recent tax package, a trillion dollars of stimulus in excess of wages lost because this fixation is totally on the level of unemployed. And they don't really care about inflation consequences of what they're doing. So I think that we have pulled demand forward and we're at a level of valuation where the prospective one year, three and five year returns in the equity market, once this craziness is behind us, uh, is gonna be very pedestrian. And I, I like to call them personal experiences. 
So I got my MBA from Columbia Business School on January 31st of 1967. I had a student loan, had a six month old child when I graduated, I had no money in the bank and I was broke. I couldn't afford a vacation. So I went to work at Goldman the very next day, February 1st of 67. The Dow was roughly a thousand and 15 years later it was a thousand, but I made my money picking stocks. And I think we're in store for a period with the returns in the S&P 500 going to be very pedestrian. You have to make your money as a stock picker, which is fine because that's what I do for a living. Uh, page exhibit 15. These are my long term concerns. I think uh, our fiscal policy and monetary policy is out of control. Uh, you know, this nation was founded 245 years ago. Uh, we had zero uh, national debt. And uh, I guess three or four years ago, we got up to 245. We, uh, 245 years, we went from zero to 20 trillion of national debt. And that's gone up 8 trillion in the last three years. That's a growth rate far in excess of the growth rate of the economy. I think more and more of our income is going to have to be dedicated to debt service, which I think will uh, penalize uh, uh, growth characteristics of the economy. Similarly, if you look at Exhibit 16, the national debt now exceeds where we were in the end of World War II. Thankfully, we're in peacetime. We're not in wartime, and hopefully we stay in peacetime. But I'm very concerned about this debt buildup. And we really have, uh, I voted, you know, I said there's no secrecy. I voted for Biden uh, only because uh, I feared uh, Trump more than I feared the progressives. I, I, I have a certain value system that I was willing to take a chance that 100 U.S. senators and 300 members of Congress would do the right thing rather than taking a chance on a one person would be dictator. So I voted for Biden, but he is, uh, he, he, He's as bad as I thought he would be, maybe a little bit worse actually. Uh, he's a big government guy and uh, uh, we have to get our spending under control. And until we do, I, uh, I think we're heading towards a difficult uh, uh, outcome. You know, I, I, don't, I know this does not end well, but what I don't know is when it's going to end, which brings me to Exhibit 17 uh, and 18. So if you came to me in 2008 and said, Lee, uh, I heard about you from Henrik and John. You have a great reputation. You have a great record. I want to put all my money with you. I would say that's a mistake because I'm an a, a relative, I'm not a relative return manager. I'm an absolute return manager. I run short book. I run hedged. I, I don't run fully invested. And I think you're going to be in store for a, a decade long bull market in the economy and in the stock market. And you want to be in a relative return vehicle. Um, you would have had me locked up after 2008. You would have thought I was crazy. That's exactly what happened. If you look at Exhibit 18, that's the world I think we're heading into. You know, hedge funds have fallen from favor because people got tired of paying a premium fee for lagging some index like the S&P 500. But I think we're going into a two-way market now, and I think hedge funds will be in a position to distinguish themselves. So as you can see, in 1998 to 2012, why hedge funds were, comp, were, were uh, in favor, we had a market that went up and down. We just completed 15 years of the market going in one direction. That's, that's going to change. Now, this is an opinion. Uh, Exhibit 19 tries to put that opinion into context. Uh, you know, 3,000 years ago, Socrates said, I'm the wisest man alive. I know one thing, and that is I know nothing. And 3,000 years later, Warren Buffett said forecasts of the future tell you more about the forecast than they tell you about the future. So uh, I've told you what I think. Uh, I put my pants on one leg at a time. The only reason I would take me with some credibility is I have made my money as a long investor. I'm not a big short seller. Uh, you know, I have no shorts on and I can find things that I'm willing to do in the market that, uh, that I'm comfortable with. So anyway, be this in May. That's my big picture. Now, uh, Henrik, uh, I'll be happy to respond to any questions that you and your team or your viewers have. Absolutely. It's a fascinating story about your life, how you came to where you are now and, and your investments that you've made. Thank you for sharing uh, all of those slides as well. And uh, we, see from the, we see from the chat here, there's a lot of questions that are coming in for you. So starting out with your success. So you're a very successful investor. Why is that? So what are some of the factors that we can attribute your success to? Well, first of all, I attribute my success to three things. 
two of the three are, are very obvious. One is hard work. I've been a very hard worker all my business life, including now, even though I'm working for charity. Second is um, um, luck. You've got to be lucky in life. And third, which requires some explanation, is intuition. And I want to expressly go through this for the students on the, on the call. Back in the, so what are two examples of intuition that serve me well? Okay, back in the 60s, if you finished your major and minor in college in three years, you were allowed to count your first year of medical or dental school towards your fourth year of college and get a separate degree. So my major undergraduate was chemistry, my minor was math and physics. In the summer of 1963, I took physical chemistry at the University of Pennsylvania Summer School. That completed my major and I enrolled in the University of Pennsylvania Dental School in August of 1963. And after eight days, you're going to laugh, after eight days I was wondering if I was pushing myself in the direction that I was fully committed. Very traumatic time in my life because what you've got to understand is I paid my tuition uh, for a year, I paid my room and board for a year. They tell you to drill your initials with your portable drill into your equipment because it has a way of disappearing in the laboratory. So I drilled my initials into $1,200 worth of equipment which automatically was useless. Okay, and I had to go back to the, and tell my dad that I wanted to go back to undergraduate school and make a decision after a full final year. The only guy that understood the trauma I was going through was the dean of Hunter College who had to approve my matriculation back into school. And he said to me, very heroic decision, of course you can come back. I had all electives available as my major and minor were complete. I took 10 courses in the lab, my senior year in economics, got 10 A's. I found what interested me, I never looked back. So that was an example of intuition. It was painful. Where I know people that get married, where they start to have second thoughts, they say, well, the invitations went out, I can't back out. Back out, you know? Don't push yourself in a direction you're not fully committed. You know, it's a shame to, to go, other than law school, which I think gives you a good grounding for the society we're in, don't become a doctor unless you commit to, to be a doctor. Don't become a dentist unless you commit to be a dentist. Just a lot of years of hard study and of course. My second example of intuition I'm very, uh, very happy with. You know, in 1966, if you check things out, Wall Street was at a high. I was Beta Gamma Sigma, Wall Street Journal Student Achievement Award, straight A's in finance, six month old child, very attractive package. I had 16 job offers. Goldman was not my best offer, and I was broke. And the guy that made me the offer called me up and said, Lee, we're disappointed we haven't heard from you. And I said, Bob, it's very uncharacteristic for me, but I'm broke and I got four job offers for more money, but I liked everybody I met at Goldman. Your offer is 12.5. You think I can make $25,000 a year in five years? A doubling in five years, as you know, is 15% compound. And he said to me, if you work hard and keeping those clean, I think you can do it. So I said, okay, I'm coming. So I went to Goldman through intuition. Goldman was the only firm in the business that didn't change their name and engage in a merger, major merger in 150 years. I was made a partner in 1976. The firm had a record year. They earned $40 million. When I retired, they earned $1.8 billion. I was there for the whole run. So I went with a great firm, uh, had a great experience, and that was intuition, walking away for more money to go to work for somebody that I respected and I liked. So I would say, in response to your first question, partial response, Hard work, intuition, good luck. Okay, luck is part of every equation. And I'd say discipline. You know, I know that if something sounds too good to be true, it's not true. I never look for get rich schemes, get rich quick schemes. You know, I basically, I'm a, I'm a bread and butter man. I'm a meat and potatoes guy. I, I, I buy low multiples, decent dividend yields, low price to book. And that value is prayed out for me. Even though I have some, you know, growth stocks, but again, like I said, against today's interest rates, my largest position is Google. I own Amazon, I own Google, I own a little bit of Facebook, I own a little bit of Amazon. They're not expensive given their growth versus the multiple of the, of the, of the uh, in, given the level of interest rates. You, um, you worked for Goldman and you joined it um, uh, at, at a very good opportunity. So talk to us a little bit about what did you learn about values and culture within Goldman Sachs that you then brought to uh, your own firm when you opened that up? I would say a, a, a client orientation. The client came first and it's not just lip service. Uh, uh, I, I had a partnership agreement that was different than most. 
when I started my firm, I put all the money I had into the partnership, which was $36 million. And I put a provision in, you know, the investor has 45 days before the end of the year to notify you of your intent to add or take away capital. I put a provision in, if I was to reduce my capital below $36 million, I had to tell you 60 days in advance. I call that my inside selling provision. And then I had a below market fee. I gave anybody like uh, Miami University a 25% discount on the fee. I, was, I always looked at the world through the eyes of the investor. And that was the Goldman Sachs of old. I'm not going to say anything about Goldman Sachs presently. But uh, they were very client oriented. I took that client orientation with me. One question that shows up here in the uh, chat is about your investment style. And, you know, so can you elaborate? a little bit about how you think about uh, your own investment philosophy and what kind of stocks that you would uh, invest in. And, and a related question to that that several are asking as well has to do with uh, you're an iconic investor like Warren Buffett. So what, what is the similarity and what is the difference in terms of the Cooperman style compared to the Buffett style? Yeah, very similar to Buffett, but he's got a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot more zeros. Uh, you know, uh, I have a great respect for Warren. I've taken the giving pledge with Warren. In fact, when I took it nine years ago, I told him, if you're speaking to wealthy people, uh, you're not asking for enough by asking for half. I intend to give it all away. And I said, nor is it an original concept. I told him in 1900, Andrew Carnegie said, who dies rich dies disgraced. In 1930, Sir Winston Churchill said, you make a living by what you get, you make a life by what you give. In 1961, when President Kennedy was inaugurated president, he said, ask not what you could do for you. ask not what your country could do for you, ask what you could do for your country. And I told him, you know, I'm Jewish, and they say in the Talmud, you measure man not by what he has or what he gives. And uh, the difference between Warren and I is he elected to give his money to Bill and Melinda Gates, and I've elected to give my money away directly to those organizations and institutions that have made a difference to me and my family in my lifetime. But uh, he's rubbed off of me, and he's a value investor, he's a long term investor which would I, I do, you know, I, I, I very rarely buy anything that doesn't have earnings and I buy below market multiples. Uh, but I do have, I'm looking over now just to share with you um, um, some of my holdings in my family office. I have growth, but growth at a reasonable price. So I have Alphabet, uh, it's 25 times next year's earnings, you know, not expensive given what it is. Amazon, that's very expensive, that's 60 times earnings, but unique company. I uh, have Ashland under 20 times, Athene 10 times, uh, Citigroup under tangible book value 10 times, Cigna 10 times. You know, I'm patient. You know, what I've said to the, the young people working for me, if every stock we own is going up and it's on a new high list, that means you're a momentum investor. If everything you own is on a new low list and going down, you're out of business. And I have a combination of you know, things that are working and things that are not working. I'm much more inclined to buy things that are not working uh, because I like to buy things that are out of favor, that are cheap. Fair, fair enough. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, students that aspire to go into wealth management and to become financial advisors. We have a lot of alumni that are in that line of business. And some of them are asking you uh, through the chat here, what kind of advice do you have for them given the current market conditions? What should they tell clients and, um, you know, given the market situation? Very difficult. I would say that I don't envy them. Uh, I think bonds are a bubble. So my first advice is keep the duration of your client's bond portfolio to as short as you can um, and stick with value. And uh, probably the most painful asset to hold right now is cash. So I would probably have no bonds or as little as you can get away with and maybe 20% cash and 80% in value stocks. But, you know, it's this, this is a very difficult period, you know, uh, to do, you know, the Fed has been busy pushing everybody on the risk curve. And I'm very critical of Powell. You know, he says that the market's not expensive given where interest rates are, but interest rates make no sense. You know, uh, the marginal tax rate of people that are saving money is probably 35 to 40%. So if you keep 60% of 1.5%, that's 90 basis points. The inflation rate in the last 12 months is 6%. So you're getting your capital confiscated. 
why do you knowingly want to have your capital confiscated? Ten-year rates in Germany are zero. Ten-year rates in Japan are zero. You know, um, we just uh, we have a bunch of academics running monetary policy, which I think has a long-term consequence. You know, uh, if your, your financial advisors, their client comes to them and says, "Look, I've been lucky. I've saved up a, a two or three million dollars over my lifetime. What do I do with money? I want to retire." The guy says, "You can't retire. You can't get any money in your savings." That makes it more difficult for young people to enter the labor force. So I'm sympathetic. I'd like to be the age of the youngsters on the call, but I'd like to have my net worth. That's a different combination that's very hard to achieve. Certainly. Uh, maybe switching gears a little bit, you know, back in 2018, so not that long time ago, basically you decided with Omega to move away from external money management to make it into a family office. So what was the thinking uh, behind that decision and has that affected the investment decisions that you make now going forward? Well, I was shocked that I did that, to be honest with you. And everybody that knows me was shocked because I, I love what I do. I never looked at it as work. Okay. Uh, and so when everybody called me up, I'm going to answer your question indirectly and said, well, how's your life going to change? Which is a kind of part of your question. I tell them, well, I've gotten up every day at 5, 10 in the morning to slip into New York. I'm going to sleep at least an hour later in the morning, which I've been doing. Secondly, I'm, going to, uh, I'm, I'm a bit chunky, and I'm going to get to the gym three times a week to try to get down to a more normal size. And I've been doing that. The third thing I was going to do, I have a very good card sense, and I know how to play a bridge hand, but I, know, I don't know the bidding. So I want to take time to learn how to bid and bridge. Unfortunately, I've been so damn busy in retirement, I've not taken one bridge lesson, and uh, so I've not succeeded in doing that. On the investing side, I said I was going to be uh, more long-term oriented, be more tax sensitive, because my investors never paid me for tax sensitivity. They looked at pre-tax returns against extra tax returns. That's one of the great distinguishing things about Buffett's record. People are critical of his last decade, but you know, he's minimized his tax burden. So I would say that uh, more tax sensitivity, given the fact that I'm very heavily invested in marketable securities, I would probably look to put more money into private deals, whether it be real estate or other kind of venture capital or other kind of things. I don't have much in Bitcoin, though. <laughs> well, you mentioned Bitcoin. You have to. I think we have a couple of questions about that as well. What's I take a cop out. Uh, bear with me. Uh, this is my... This is my fabulous granddaughter. Courtney, I'm giving a talk to about 500 people. Can I call you back? Okay, bye-bye. That's my granddaughter, Courtney. She just called hey. me. I sent her a gift basket. So on schedule, she's calling to thank me. There anyway, you go. Um, basically, but give me the question again. Well, we were talking a little bit about the crypto Bitcoin, space. Bitcoin. But Bitcoin. So yeah. I take the easy way out. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's fine. Somebody that's... said, if you don't understand Bitcoin, that means you're old. I'm old. I don't understand it. I don't have believe in it. I have a couple million dollars with a money manager who's been very right on it. He has a 4% position. So I have 4% of 2 million or $80,000 in Bitcoin. That's the extent of my involvement. I don't believe in it. I think it's gonna have a bad end. You know, and the thing that influences me, you know, and I know some smart people that are involved, but you know, a guy had $2 million in Bitcoin and because he forgot his password, he had, I think, 10 attempts to retrieve his password. And on the 10th attempt, you lose access to your money. Who the hell wants to own an asset like that? So I'd rather own gold, even though I'm not even gold oriented either. Certainly, it's a different uh, kind of uh, risk there with uh, losing the password. Um, you know, on, on that note, so you have seen many different type of markets. So the 70s, 87 crash, 94, uh, 2001, 2008 global financial crisis. Um, from, from sort of a risk management and a downside protection uh, perspective, you know, what are some of the takeaways for current so, investors so, now? Uh, right and now, I think the market is very expensive, so I would not use any borrowed funds. I'm not a margin buyer. I would be diversified. You know, I have 50 positions in my family office, uh, and I know what I own. Every company I have in my portfolio, we speak with the managements. We give them the chance to lie to us. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say diversification, 
uh, value orientation, no margin. So, um, so t t tell us a little bit about um, your philanthropic side as well and, and your giving. What, uh, yeah. what do you want to uh, accomplish? Well, I want to make the world a better place. So, you know, um, I have determined and figured out a long time ago, and I'll share this with the senior citizens and your audience, there's only four things you can do with money. The first thing you can do with money is you can pleasure yourself by buying planes, boats, art, cars. I'm married 57 years to the same woman. My wife was an educator for 35 years. She was a specialist with learning disabled children. So she worked and neither one of us are uh, consumers. I, we both happen to be of the view, me more than her, that material possessions brings with it aggravation. So, um, you know, I, I don't collect art. Uh, I'm not a sports enthusiast and uh, I don't want more homes and stuff like that. And so, um, uh, uh, when I was working, I had excess income and uh, I had no out in that regard because I didn't want to buy things. Don't get me wrong, you know, certain people have a need. I have a neighbor here, I live in St. Andrews Country Club in Boca Raton, uh, who drives two Bentleys. Okay, I drive a uh, Hyundai. Okay, and I can afford the Bentleys. I just gave away $100 million to St. Barnabas Medical Center so I could divide that by 250. That's what that's. That's 400 or 40 uh, Bentleys. It's a lot of cars, that's for yeah. sure. So, but he understood himself. He says it's very important to his self-image. I have no problem with my self-image. So the first thing you can do with money is you pleasure yourself. I, I'm not there. Second thing you do with money is you give it to your kids. But if you have a lot of money, giving all your money to your kids is a big mistake because you deprive them of self-achievement. And plus, when my kids were growing up, I didn't have a lot of money. So my older boy is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Stanford, as is his, his daughter graduated Stanford Phi Beta Kappa, um, and he has an MBA from Wharton, and he was successful in business running his own hedge fund, he retired. And his younger brother is a scientist, has a PhD from Oregon State University. So I didn't want to give them all my money because I want them to be self-achieved. Third thing you do with money is give it to the government, but only a fool gives the government money you don't have to give them. You give them your tax money, you pay your taxes as a citizen, but you don't, know, you don't volunteer to pay more. And the fourth thing you do with money is recycle back in society to try to make the world a better place. So the thing that I'm most proud of is I gave $50 million to send a thousand kids in Newark, New Jersey to college. And you know, you're really changing lives. The average lifetime earnings of a college graduate exceeds by well over a million dollars a non-college graduate, plus you're giving them skill set to be more competitive in society. I gave $40 million to Hunter College where I got my degree. I feel I owed him a debt of gratitude. I got a wife for 57 years, and I got a degree for 24 hours a semester. I gave Columbia a similar sum of money. I've given a lot of money away in the Jewish world. And so I've given $100 million to St. $150 million to St. Barnabas Medical Center, $25 million to Boca Regional Hospital. So as you know, organizations and institutions have made a difference to me and my family in my lifetime, and education, and uh, you know, fostering equality. In, in yeah. Equality. Um, so it, it, switching gears a little bit to uh, another question, because students are first at Miami Herbert Business School. So we want to throw in a couple of more questions from our students. Sure. And one question is, what advice would you have for someone that is an incoming uh, junior analyst with Goldman Sachs now? What, what would you tell him or her? Well, be prepared for indentured servitude. <laughs> My son graduated Stanford Phi Beta Kappa. His best job offer was a two-year analyst program at Goldman. Okay, after four months, he came to me and said, this is bullshit. They called me in the middle of the night to Xerox presentation booklets. I didn't get an, a, a Phi Beta Kappa degree in economics to Xerox presentation books. I'm going to quit. What do you think? I said, look, do me a favor. They don't care that you're going to quit, but your boss has a boss. Tell the guy that runs the training program you're not happy. So when he, tell, when he reports to his superior, He'll be able to tell them that you're not happy. And this way, if you quit, he's not shocked. Second thing, you know you have to support yourself. And third thing is you ask my opinion, which you've done. And the fourth thing I told him about my experience in dental school, and he quit. So when I don't go to work just because of money. But if you go to work at Goldman, you'll be prepared to work very hard. You'll be rewarded amply. But if hard work isn't your game, don't go there. Now, I would say before business school, 
make sure you take some courses in writing, take some courses in statistics, operations, research, and the computer. If you're not, if you're not adept at using the computer and spreadsheets, you're going to be lost. And writing is very important to communicate with your clients. Great. We, I think we have time for only one more question here. We're up against the clock, but uh, we have some questions also related to uh, sustainability and sustainable finance. And so what, what's your take on the ESG and different screens that more and more portfolio managers, they impose on their investments? Uh, what, what's your I look view at that, that negatively. And I, I, I believe in, I said, I have a son who's a PhD in environmental sciences. And I gave a lot of money to Conservation International and other conservation causes, but I don't believe in accepting restrictions on investing. If what a company does is legal, uh, I'm fine. I don't buy tobacco companies because I don't like tobacco. But uh, if it's legal, uh, you know, this year I'm up 40%. Before today, I had a bad day today. You know, I have 15% of my fund in energy. You know, I, 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 I'm not ESG focused. I go with the best value proposition exists. Fair enough. This has been an incredible, um, informative one hour of information packed with numbers and other content. Life story is uh, fantastic. So let me hand over to, uh, to Dean Quelch uh, to uh, help out wrapping things up. Well, Dean. thank you very much, Henrik. And uh, thanks again, Lee. I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you'll agree with me that uh, this evening we've uh, uh, been privileged to be with someone who's uh, exemplary uh, as a business person in our uh, free market system and as a humanitarian. So thank you very much, Lee, for uh, joining us and uh, all let's, the best. My pleasure. Thank you for your kind words. And let's all re remember that capitalism brought us to this place. And, you know, what I say is the main vice of capitalism is the uneven distribution of prosperity. The main vice of socialism is the equal distribution of misery. And uh, let us let us hope that Manchin has his way and doesn't cave in. <laughs> all right. And I wish everybody on the phone good luck and much success and good health. And thank you for including me. Right. Uh, good, good night, uh, Lee, and uh, good night uh, from us in Miami. And thank you again for joining us. My pleasure.